Author Barbara Kingsolver once said that the very least you can do in your life is to figure out what you hope for. And the very most you can do is to live by that hope. Now, like many of you, my greatest hope is that as a civilization, we can rise to meet the challenge of climate change. And to me, living inside that hope is getting everybody else on board. The last time I was standing in front of an audience like this, being filmed and shared online, I had the Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark theme song absolutely blaring out of my butt pocket. And it wasn't an attempt for me to make a more dramatic appearance. This was, in fact, my cell phone ringtone. And I was so sure that it was through the sound system and the whole audience could hear it. My parents would be so embarrassed. And I was just about to pause in my speech and say, guy, who is calling me right now? Like, I'm a little busy. And then I realized I had gone for a reason. I was expecting so. That day, October 24, 2009, I was a scrappy young 20-year-old and I was getting a healthy dose of a new kind of activism. I was speaking, I was speaking as the visionary behind this Ottawa event for the International Day of Climate Action. And we were joined simultaneously by thousands of events around the world under the rallying cry of 350, as in 350 parts per million carbon dioxide, which is considered the safe level of carbon dioxide we can have in our atmosphere. And that call, that was Vancouver. Because as the two largest events in the country, we had decided that we wanted to celebrate together on a big day. And so when I saw the number after, I immediately called back at Jake Corey at Lionsgate Bridge and I said to the nearby crowd, I held up my phone, I said, folks, there are a lot of people in Vancouver who think you are just great. How do you feel about that? And it turns out they felt pretty good. We all did. And that's worth knowing. I mentioned a new kind of activism because from my experience in activism, 350 did really fit the paradigm. It was fun, it was happy, it was worldwide, so diverse, and it was profoundly beautiful. And my experiences with 350 and the wisdom of my volunteer team actually taught me to rethink civic engagement. And I started strategizing ways that I could combine the momentum, the positivity of 350.org with perhaps the impact of more confrontational tactics. And over the next few years at Guelph, I was able to get quite a bit of experience testing the waters with these along, alongside my uh, sounding wall, my activator, and my best buddy, Yvonne Sue. And over the next few minutes, I'd like to take you behind the scenes of, of our most popular campaign and explain to you how our idea of proceeding past the paradigm actually ended up being pretty darn close to the standard rules for radicals. I want to explain our process and our strategy in hopes that you can glean something positive for your own organizing. So, proceeding past the paradigm is thinking outside the box, I should first explain what we thought the box was. And to us, this was activism as we knew it, you know, like signing petitions, um, protests with signs of chance, taking over the streets on a huge march, dropping banners. These can be really awesome if you have the resources to do it. And we just did it. We did, however, have our friends, we had YouTube, and we had a good reputation. After one of our previous events in the year, our very brave participants ended up seeing themselves proudly dancing on national television in their underwear. And after that home run, we, uh, we were granted a lot of confidence from the student body. In fact, we had a ton of emails saying, next time you two pull some crazy stunt, you count me in. But the next time we pulled some crazy stunt, we wanted it to appeal to people who weren't considering themselves activists. And we kept that in mind all the way over to spring, when Canada's parliament fell. I remember the day because I was writing a final paper and I had Twitter open in one window, I had the news in the other, and my word processor was experiencing serious neglect. And I remember thinking when the federal election was announced that I wanted to campaign for climate action and I just didn't know quite how yet. And I was dialing Yvonne's number just as she called me up and she said, Grayson, I think we should do something for the federal election. And I said, my thoughts exactly, girl. The way we saw it, if young people actually voted, we'd probably have a government that actually cares about climate change. And so we were really, really motivated to get young people out to exercise their democratic rights. And it was great because this wasn't activist -y. Even our saltiest critics, our most skeptical participants, were gonna have a really hard time shooting down democracy and citizenship. So this time we were going to hold a vote mob. And within a week, Yvonne had rounded up equipment and megaphones and videographers this girl wanted cameras like Christopher Walken wanted cowbell. And I was working on, on the event design, you know, the choreography of it, and media strategy. I was drafting press releases and, and messages that I could send to anyone I thought would find our story newsworthy. At the same time, famous comedian Rick Mercer was getting thumbs up all over the internet for his video rant to encourage youth to vote. And people were loving it, so we turned it into our narrative. You know, like, you, me, Rick 
Mercer, vote mom, eh? And people were like, yeah, I'll do it for Rick. So uh, it was a really good time to shoot this video. We loved it. Everybody was waiting really excitedly with their fingers hovering over that Facebook share button for the YouTube link to go live. And when it did, I doled out a few high fives and then blasted my media messages and crossed my fingers, each with their own character, each encouraging youth to cast a ballot. And it really changed the dialogue of the election. It brought smiles to people's faces amid the dirty mudslinging that we used to. And the positivity and solidarity that we felt felt to me the very same as Indiana Jones and Cooper calling back in 2009. We felt like we created something positive and unique and powerful with wheels, a new kind of activism. Later that year, I poured over Saul Linsky's Rules for Radicals. Now, from my understanding, this is the Bible of activism. This is how the serious players fought the game. And also from my understanding, I wasn't much of a radical. In fact, my goal was to make doing the right thing mainstream practice. Although when I looked at the book, I realized that our most successful campaigns were the ones that most closely adhere to these 11 rules. And so I'd like to go through my four favorites with you, because I think that they are responsible for the actions of myself and a few friends transpiring into a national movement. So the first, never go outside the experience of your people, but whenever possible, go outside the experience of an opponent. For us, we wanted to make sure that none of our participants were doing something that they didn't already feel completely comfortable with. So we created the same kind of atmosphere as homecoming, and then we just asked them to go on Facebook and Twitter after, and of course vote. For our opponents, anyone who is actively excluding youth from the political process, they had no idea what to make of thousands of students across the country that were treating the election like a football game. You know, boom, 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 boom. And they definitely didn't know how to control social media to their advantage. Make opponents live up to their own book of rules. This one I mentioned before, democracy. Nobody could argue with us. We weren't asking for a certain party to come to power. We were just asking that people exercise their right to choose leaders that they thought displayed true leadership. Ridicule is your most potent tactic. It's hard to counter, and the opposition often reacts to your advantage. We all know what political leaders get like when an election is called. They are so jazzed to invite everybody to their campaign and they throw these barn burner speeches about the value of a healthy democracy. And so we responded to this with a very fervent desire to be part of the political process. A lot of them have revealed their true colors and they reacted in hostility. And in turn, that gave them a lot of negative press. If your people aren't having a ball doing it, there's something very wrong with your tactic. This is the most important one at all. These are very serious issues. I know that. However, if you're trying to get a lot of people engaged, ominous probably is the worst that you want to put your money on. Our most successful campaigns, the ones that got the most attention and the most participation, would have been really fun to do, even without that moral directive. So I learned through experience that Saul Linsky imparts in his rules for radicals. And instead of making me an activist -y type, just conditioned my strategic thinking and made me a better mobilizer. And I'm sharing this with you because we've got so many improvements to make out there and right here at home. And if you can't outspend an opponent, I really hope that you can outsmart them. Now, goodness knows that we didn't win this challenge or with one campaign or one year, but we're very happy to have started the process to have united young movers and shakers from across the country and to have exposed thousands of youth to a positive, and creative kind of activism, and hopes that we can rise to meet today's challenges together.